Garcia's Esther Robb, the Holocaust Museum and Goodwin Education Center, welcoming all of you to our ninth annual second and third and perhaps fourth generation brunch. And because of the brunch, I added my background. So hopefully it's getting people hungry. You have to bring your own bagel though. Um, for those of you who may be new to our organization, we'd like to um, uh, have you know a little bit about the work of our Rob Goodwin Center. We connect survivors as well as their children and grandchildren with students throughout the South Jersey area. We wanna be sure that students learn about the history of the Holocaust and the consequences of hate. We offer performances to continue to teach these lessons. We schedule teacher training programs to help teachers become more knowledgeable and more comfortable teaching this difficult part of history. We encourage young students to promote kindness and acceptance by sending our guest readers into classrooms whether it be in person or virtually. We offer tours of our own special local museum housed in the JCC in Cherry Hill, as well as United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC, and we do so much more. But this morning, we gathered to help bring and keep the children, grandchildren, and even great-grandchildren of survivors together. Uh, for all the newcomers, and in particular, we want to welcome members of the Philly 3G who are joining us, uh, as well as those of you who we see each and every year. I'd like to thank you for joining us, and I know that uh, we're all looking forward to being together again, hopefully in person next year, to munch on the things behind me and listen to a great program. Um, as the number of survivors of the Holocaust is dwindling, many of our cherished survivors are finding it difficult to leave programs personally. It's more and more important for those of us who are children, grandchildren, and soon great-grandchildren of Holocaust survivors to keep bringing the message of fighting anti-Semitism, bullying, and bigotry in all its forms to our community, and in particular to the children of our community. In the era of Holocaust deniers and increasingly evident anti-Semitism, we must make sure that our message continues to be heard loud and clear. It is for this reason that we have chosen today's speaker, Mel Leitner, the author of the book, uh, What They Didn't Burn, who will be sharing his story as he traced his father's experiences. But before we talk about the special book, let me first introduce Wendy Clear, a J JFCS geriatric social worker, who will share with you how JFCS can help you and the survivors of our community. Wendy? Thank you, John, and good morning, everyone. My name is Wendy Clear, and I'm a geriatric social worker working with Holocaust survivors and their families for Jewish Family and Children's Services in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, along with Gail Belfer, the Director of Holocaust Survivor Services and Advocacy. We provide intensive, concrete, and emotional services to both survivors and their families. Just to name a few, we provide counseling, groups, kosher food pantry, catered meals, and resources. During the pandemic, we have gone fully remote with all of our groups. So if you have any expertise or talents, we would love to hear from you, so give us a ring. Now I would like to introduce Judy Wisber, the chair of our Second Generation Committee. Judy? Good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, yes, I, it's so wonderful to see everyone this morning. And uh, as John said, I'm, I too am looking forward to uh, hopefully uh, seeing all of you in person next year with uh, bagels and cream cheese in hand. Uh, but it, we do have a great program today and I'm uh, really pleased to be able to introduce to you our special guests for today's program. We're honored and delighted to have with us the renowned journalist and author Mel Leitner, who will be interviewed by our own Rachel Howe. Many of you probably know Rachel, who has been a member of the Rob Goodwin Steering Committee for some time. We're fortunate to host Mr. Leitner today through Rachel's parents, Bucky and Tanya Buckman, who arranged for the contact between us. As I understand it, and now I've confirmed it this morning, Bucky and Mel uh, were friends in childhood. Uh, and we're very grateful to the Buckmans for uh, helping us make this happen. So as to Rachel, Rachel to me is a superstar. Uh, being the mother of four children hasn't slowed her down. She's a grant writer for Temple University where she has taught first year writing and creative writing. She has published several short stories, poems and essays. And as if that weren't enough, 
She helped to start 3G Philly, a new organization for grandchildren uh, of survivors. She herself is the grandchild of two Holocaust survivors, her maternal grandfather and her paternal grandmother. Thank you so much, Rachel, for all you do for Rob Goodwin and for uh, agreeing to participate in this program. Mel Leitner, um, it was a reporter and editor of hard news for some 20 years, much of it as a foreign correspondent covering the Middle East for NBC News and for United Press International. He began as a local reporter in New York City, moving on to become a foreign correspondent in London and eventually in Israel where he was recruited by NBC News. He holds master's degrees from Columbia Graduate School of Journalism with a concentration in broadcast news and from Columbia's School of International and Public Affairs. I would like to share with you a description of his latest book, which you'll hear more about, What They Didn't Burn, Uncovering My Father's Holocaust Secrets. Uh, this description, I'm sure, that each of us as children and grandchildren of survivors can relate to. The book is, quote, a heartwarming, inspiring story of resilience and redemption. A story of how desperate survivors turned hopeful refugees rebuilt their shattered lives in America, all the while struggling with the lingering trauma that has impacted their children to this day. Mr. Leitner identifies a recurring theme in his book in which he asks how we, children and grandchildren of survivors, can preserve our parents' history, especially for increasingly skeptical younger generations further and further removed from the war. We look forward to hearing from Mr. Leitner about that, and we welcome both Rachel and Mr. Leitner. Thank you. Great. Well, Mel, I'm so glad that you could join us today. It means so much, obviously, on a personal level with my parents having connection to you. And also because this is such an important book. Um, I really enjoyed reading it. We've had a chance to connect a little bit before this. And I, I don't think I managed to say how much I really enjoyed reading the book. Um, so this is really the story um, of your discovery um, of, of wanting to know more about your father's story, but also really starting to delve into it as from an analytical side as a reporter, once you found some really interesting documents, which we'll get to um, shortly. Um, but it also ends up being a story about you and, and how you uh, experienced your father's story, how you were, how, how you uh, grew up as a 2G and, um, and what writing this book um, really the experience of writing this and, and finding out about all of these stories. So I hope that we'll have a chance to get to all of that. Um, I think we're going to ask you to begin with um, a short introduction to kind of give everybody who hasn't had a chance to read it yet um, a sense of what the book is about and also a sense of your writing style. Thank you. Um, okay, I'll start. This is uh, actually from the introduction of the book, which I think sets the uh, tone and uh, lays out why it, the book was written. They burned his younger sister and her two-year-old daughter. They burned his half-brothers and their families. They burned his uncles and their wives. They murdered the sister's husband. He probably wasn't burned, but dumped into a shallow mass grave in the hills above a small village in Western Poland. What they didn't burn when they could, excuse me, when they couldn't burn any more people, they set about burning the records and documents to hide their sins. What they didn't burn was a paper trail that tracked the man's journey through ghettos, slave labor, concentration camps, death marches, and more. They didn't burn the hidden records that revealed surprising and painful incidents he had never talked about, at least not to me, his son. It's not that my father, Joseph Dalek Leitner, never told me stories about the war. He did, many of them. As a child, we would snuggle on the green living room armchair with the tassels, daddy's chair, as he spoke of survival and escape from Hitler and the Nazis, a phrase always uttered as a single malignant noun. 
When my young daughters and nieces asked about the grandfather they had never met, I would recount Grandpa Joe's stories that came to mind at the moment. I had been a reporter for some 20 years and prided myself on knowing how to spin a story. The children listened politely, asked a question or two, and reliably proclaimed the story amazing. Yet doubt snagged. Did the story really stick? Would it be remembered, if at all, more as family fable than family fact? Though but one generation removed, was I one generation too far to recapture the poignant humanity, the essential truth of my father's calm measured voice. As a former journalist, I knew that relying on my memories of my father's remembered stories could never pass any sniff test of reporting 101. Where was the corroboration, the proof, the facts? The truth was I had no facts, only memories of facts. I could tell my daughters no more because I knew no more. I had been repeating my father's vague vignettes in a vacuum. Like my father, every Holocaust survivor has an amazing story. If they didn't, they wouldn't have survived. Yet if the stories sound too amazing, they risk, they risk being dismissed as exaggerations or worse. How will their stories be remembered by future generations further and further removed from the war. <clears throat> As I exhumed the documents they didn't burn from archives in Poland, Germany, France, Israel, and Washington, a gradual realization imposed the somber discipline I had not anticipated. From the most unlikeliest of sources, the Nazis themselves, the documents corroborate not only a man's chronology, but also the chronology of his camp comrades, those who survived and those who did not. These yellowing papers demanded respect for mixing the warm memories of my father's stories with the cold facts from these documents, risk yielding a tepid brew that satisfied neither the soul nor the intellect. Still, I would have to resist the dramatic insignificant draw sharp conclusions from vague evidence, or conversely, ignore hard evidence in favor of facts I might reasonably presume just to improve the narrative. Yeah, so that's um, a real balancing act that you set up, right, between how you're going to tell this story and where, where are the facts going to come in, sort of like the science and the storytelling and how to balance those. So that's really going to um, provide the backbone of our conversation today. Um, this is a book that um, in many ways you started when you were a young reporter. You, were, you mentioned that um, questions from your daughters and your nieces really set you thinking about how to, how to retell those stories that your father had told you as anecdotes and really questioning what what was real, what was embellished, what was elided. Um, so you started this when you were a much younger reporter um, after your father died. Um, I know that with my own grandfather um, and just you know talking to him and just forcing myself to start your book, I found it very hard to get started and to push myself into asking those questions and to push myself into reading your book and reading many other Holocaust books. It's really hard to kind of like take that leap and go into those dark places. Um, I noticed that even when you started the research in earnest, um, it was about, it was 2005, so that's 15 years ago. Um, I know it takes a few years to write a book, but, but that's quite a while ago. I'm wondering, why do you think it took you so long to do this work from the time you were having those conversations with your daughters to the time you, um, you know, started to have conversations with your father's old um, colleagues in, I don't know what to say, what's the word for uh, people who work in the comrades um and then to really starting to do heavy heavy research to writing and publishing the book um was it hard to push yourself into it what what took well, the th long? there's a there's a, a rather uh, pedestrian reason uh which is not at all sexy uh, i started the book at the end i started uh looking things up at the end of 2005 is true and then in 2006 and i was working uh, I have kids, you know, we, life goes on and you don't do this full time. Um, and I went to uh, Poland uh, in 2006 
And then something called the Great Recession hit in 2007. And from that point on, I put the book aside for a number of years because life got in the way. Uh, you know, it was, uh, I was in business at that point and it was quite difficult. It was very challenging and very aggravating. And we had some tough times as a lot of Americans did. And I really didn't pick it up again until 2012 or so. And it was like almost restarting. And I was gonna go back to Poland and then other than again, life got in the way and I didn't get back until 2015, which uh, I, I refer to at the end of the book, that chapter um, and things had changed. And then of course you go through the publishing process and that's never quick. Uh, and so I had signed my contract uh, in early 2020, but their catalog only came out in the fall of 2021, and here we are. I I appreciate um, some of some of the grit that that took to to really get that started. I think so many of the people listening um, think about telling their parents' stories, or maybe even think about writing it down. But life gets in the way. So um, I, you said it's not sexy, but I, I think it's a really a good life lesson for everyone to hear, and and really makes me appreciate the effort that that it took to get this published. Um, in your research, you discover how valuable your father's diamonds and black market dealings were to keeping him alive. He had been very wealthy before the war and he was able to um, uh, you know, hide some of that and, and use it very, um, very wisely um, to uh, you know, get the food and, and other things he needed to be able to stay alive um, and even to help other people. But you as a son only knew him to be an honest, hardworking, quiet man who didn't like to gamble. So how did your discovery change your perception of your father? And how did that reorientation sort of realizing that your father was not exactly who you thought he was when he was alive, how did that change you? How did that make you feel? Well, as, as I, as I uh, said in the introduction, um, uh, you know, I knew his stories, and of course, the son believes the father's stories. But as I got older, um, I also wondered, uh, well, as you said, how much of the stories took place. There were bits and pieces. There was no context. And um, I started this out really because I wanted to write a fictional piece. Uh, I was coming out of the recession, actually, and I, I needed to, to do something to get my sanity back. And I started by wanting to do a fictional piece on a story that I introduce in uh, chapter one called Finding Bill Ball. Um, well, that might be chapter two, but Finding Bill Ball. And serendipitously, when I started looking for context, I started confirming some basic facts, where my father was, in which labor camp, that there were British POWs there, and then I, you know, I started looking for more, I started questioning relatives, started getting more facts, and then the ball started rolling. And as I describe in the book, I started, you know, uh, reporting, which is what I do. And uh, one thing led to the other, and whenever we're ready for it, we'll, I'll, I'll explain how that works. I'm going to push back before we get there because um, I, I hear a lot of the um, the practical sides of it, which is very interesting. But I guess I'm really asking about your emotions. How did it change how you saw your father? And then how did that change affect you? Oh, at the end of the process, which is really only comes, you really only wrestle it when you're writing the end of the book and you realize you got to somehow come to terms with that. Pretty much, uh, I pushed it back, you know, I pushed it away uh, until I had to write, write it. And then I realized that um, somewhere along this process, it occurred to me that for all of my childhood, in other words, until I got into college, at least, my father had been suffering from some form of PTSD, some form of depression. I didn't know it. I mean, dad was dad right? He was quiet. He was funny. He, he took me to the movies. We, you know, he was dad, uh, a loving dad. I had no idea until I ended this, just how much the war had changed him. To me, dad had always been a, 
passive, quiet, studious guy who never stood out in a crowd, never made waves, you know, retiring. And then, you know, from the get go, I'm hearing stories that this guy was a son of a bitch. This guy was a, 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 a wheeler dealer. This guy did this, this guy did. And, and then when you hear these things, that's one thing. But then when you get the German documents, which confirm it, you know, that's, that's just mind blowing. And uh, at, at, at a clear point, I knew I had a book here. And it took a while to figure out the balance, as you say, between personal memoir and reportage. But I knew I wanted to take the reader with me on this trip. I wanted the reader to experience the discoveries as I had. And, and just uh, for clarity, um, for those who haven't read it, when and we'll look at the actual documents in a minute. Um, but some of the documents that confirmed things were, um, you know, finding out that he had had these diamonds and that he had used them to try to get things in the war, you know, through the Germans and try to sell them and that he was hiding these things. So that's sort of some of what you heard and then were later confirmed in the documents. So um, let's get to those documents. Um, I'm going to just ask you a very simple question, Mel. What is truth? That's a joke, um, you know, but I, I think that it, it really does raise this question because, you know, what is truth? What is memory? Um, you know, these are hard things. Is it if we remember it that way, is it true or is it not true because we find documents that show it to be so? Um, and I think that this is a really big question. As you say, part of your motivation for writing this book was to shut up some of the Holocaust deniers to show that there's there's hard proof there. Um, so I know that it was uh, finding the documents that really set you on this journey, but I, I did wonder as I read it, because for me, some of the parts that I connected with were the parts that were more story, right? Were the parts that were more from that emotional place. Some of the parts that I really connected with were both when you write from your father's perspective of going through the war, and also when you write from your own perspective, which I know you've said was the hardest part to write about your own memories, your own perspective of growing up in your father's household, of, of, of visiting um, your father's old house in Poland, of, of you know the emotional moments that you had, not as a reporter, but as a person and as a son. Um, so I do wonder why did you feel the need to center the documents rather than simply use them as a way to back up the central facts of your dad's story and your own? Why not let them melt into the background as many memoirists do? So many memoirists will conduct background research and they'll just kind of let them be part of the story. But you really wanted to focus on the documents. Yeah. Um, first of all, I approach this as a reporter. Um, I was asked uh, in a uh, interview, um, the balance between um, separating yourself from the story. And um, I, I did that and I, uh, I still feel uh, overwhelmingly that, that that was the right way to do this. Um, we all have stories. Now you asked about truth, what is truth? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll say that we all have our own opinions of what may be true. Everybody can have an opinion, but you can't have an opinion about facts. So there's a difference between facts and what people perceive as true. I wanted to use the discipline that I had worked with for 20 years, the old school reporting 101, where you try to get at least two independent sources to uh, confirm the facts. And uh, you can then say, well, if I have two or three or four independent sources and they triangulate, I have a better, uh, I have the right or I have a better right to say this is factual. And, uh, you know, how high is up, how low is down? That's a matter of opinion. But when you reach the floor, you reach the floor. If you hit your head in the ceiling, that's a fact. So I took that approach. Uh, I never questioned it. I never thought about doing it any other way. 
to me, this was started out as uh, an exercise in Journalism 101. It was a hobby, it was fun. And later on, it evolved into much more on, on certain, for certain reasons. Really interesting, thank you. Um, so we're actually gonna take a look at some of the documents before we jump into that. Mel's gonna share his, you're gonna share your screen, right? Or is Aaron gonna put it uh, on? Aaron's gonna do it because he's much better at it than me. Okay. Well, and as we're doing, Aaron. And as we're doing that, I do see that Aaron put in the chat that if you have questions, we'll have some time to take audience questions at the end, um, but you can start putting those into the chat so they don't you know, leave your head and then you can uh, focus on what we're talking about. So go ahead, Mel, show us um, some of these really interesting documents. And I, I, I understand we have a bonus document too. Yes, I'll get to that. Okay, um, Aaron, could you please flip to document number one? There we go. Um, I hope everybody can see it clearly. About three months into my search, I had uh, re requested help from uh, contacts at the uh, uh, Holocaust Museum in DC because I'd heard that my father, from a cousin, I'd heard that my father's name appeared on some Auschwitz document and they were able to track down this. This is a registration form when the labor camp that my father was in, which is Blechhammer, and unfortunately, because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not controlling this, uh, I can't point it out on my, uh, on my screen as well as I'd like. But if you look in the upper right-hand corner, there's his Auschwitz tattoo number. If you look in the lower left-hand corner, there's his signature. And on this page, there are the questions about him, his height, his weight, his family, whether he, he was uh, convicted of any criminal acts, no. Any criminal political acts, not likely. When he was arrested, which is in the middle of the page, June 23rd, 1943, and where he was arrested. And then underneath that is a stamp that says, uh, date of arrest, uh, April 1st, 1944. Well, that was the date that Blechhammer became a subcamp of Auschwitz. And on the single page, I had more information about where he was at a certain point in time than all of his stories. And seeing his signature on the bottom with his handwriting and his birth date, uh, August 11th, uh, 1911, that he was born, uh, this was one of the key Eureka moments. And from this, I said, well, if there's one document, might there be others? And I started my search. Could you go to the next screen, please? Several months later, the Auschwitz Museum, uh, six months later, a, a half a year later, the Auschwitz Museum sends me a number of documents. And this was the first one that came across right on there. And again, this is basically a signed confession. My father's signature is on the bottom. Joseph Leitner, written in script. And this is a signed confession where he says he had sold 15 documents on the Bausteller, which was the work site, to a poll, that he received a certain amount of money, that he was going to use this money to buy food. And uh, he didn't have anything else. Uh, this is everything he had. And on the bottom, it says uh, signed, sealed, and true. And then underneath it, uh, you know, is a stamp from the, I think the Auschwitz Museum, really. And this again came as a complete shock. Dad had mentioned documents in passing, really in passing. Uh, like he, he used the small, excuse me, diamond. Uh, he used the small diamond to bribe an orderly at the uh, infirmary so he could spend a week there after he pulled his back out lifting sacks of potatoes. The point of the story wasn't the document. The point of that story was the risk he took by being in an infirmary for a week because the Gestapo would come, clear out the infirmary and send everybody to Birkenau to the gas chambers. So you didn't want to be in the infirmary uh, for very long. So that was the point of his story that uh, it was part of his great moral by saying it didn't matter if you had money or not, was stupid or smart, it was all a matter of luck. And he used that as a 
story of how this time he had something and he lucked out. Go to the next document, please. This was underneath, literally physically underneath the first document, the document just before. And this, with this document, I switched from having maybe a nice freelance article to writing a book. One of the stories my father told me that I had all but forgotten was a really complex yarn on how he tried to escape. Uh, I was a kid, maybe 10, 12 years old. And I asked him, why didn't you run away like in the movies? And he says, well, you know, I, my head was shaven. I had a tattoo. I was wearing striped pajamas. I was in Germany, not Poland. And uh, if I would have made it across the border, I probably would have been turned in for a bounty. But he did try to escape, he says. And he said, Do you remember Charlie Fetter? I go, yeah, Charlie was an old family friend. He and Charlie had... Charlie knew somebody from before the war who we met at the uh, construction site who was involved with the Polish underground. My father had been trading with the British POWs. So my father says he got the POWs to take his picture. Charlie got the guy from the Polish underground to send it to a forgery shop and make uh, forged railway ID cards. They were gonna get these cards. They were going to buy clothes from Polish workers on the work site, this huge refinery, and they were going to escape. The Gestapo, however, raided the forgery shop. And uh, they found Charlie's ID card, but not my father's. And they tracked it back to Blechhammer. They arrested Charlie. They tortured him. Charlie implicated my father. My father acted dumb, he says, I act stupid like I knew nothing about it. They didn't have any evidence. Charlie was sent to Auschwitz to be gassed. My father's line was, how he avoided death is another story, his story. And that's basically all I remember. I never told this story to my daughters. I never shared it with my nieces. And here comes this document, which is called a report. And it says the same prisoner who sold 15 diamonds for 500 Reichmarks was involved in the incident involving a forged railway identity card with prisoner Fetter Hillick, Charlie. Therefore, we conclude that this prisoner may be the go-between. And it ends, I recommend the harshest possible punishment for this prisoner. How did my dad survive? How did he live through this? Nobody could tell me. In the next few months, I visited Auschwitz. I spoke to historians there. I spoke to archivists there. Nobody could tell me anything. And it, everybody speculated, but nobody had what happened to dad. Please go to the next document. A year later, I'm watching TV. I'm bored with the Law and Order reruns. I type in my father's name in the Google, the way he spelled it in Poland, L-A-J-T-N-E-R, and up comes an article from the Jerusalem Post about a series of documents held by the ghetto fighters house in Naharia, Israel. And among them, he says, is one where Joseph Leitner received 25 lashes for selling 15 diamonds that he was going to use for food. I got in touch with the museum and they sent me this two-sided document. This is side one. And as you can see, my father's name is on it, his date of birth, the date of the incident, which is June 7th, 1944, and the brief description of 15 diamonds. And again, a connection, but a loose connection. It doesn't say that he used the diamonds for the escape attempt just says he's associated with it. May I go to the next document, please? Okay, on the flip side of the document, we have a box in the upper left-hand corner. Five, 10, 15, 20, and 25 uh, lashes or, or, or stra straps. And the number 25 is initialed. 
That means my father received 25 lashes for the 15 diamonds. And this was shocking enough. And I was trying to figure out, well, how, how do I process this? When I notice halfway down the page or two thirds way down the page is the sentence was carried out and uh, uh, officers crossed out and Haftlinga prisoner is typed in. A prisoner name, 167598 and a name, Joseph Brasov. So in other words, my father was whipped by a fellow prisoner who was Joseph Brasov. I started researching Joseph Brasov. And if you read the book, you'll, under the chapter Profile of a Capo, you will see what I uncovered about his life. I basically tracked down his life from uh, him being uh, a tough guy in Amsterdam, Holland, to uh, everything about him. Uh, and uh, it, it's a complicated story. Uh, I learned things that changed my opinion of him or modified my opinion of him. And I, I wanted to point something out. Aaron, if you can go backwards, two, two pages, another one and one more. Um, on the bottom here, on the bottom left corner, there's a note that says the main file is at Gestapo headquarters in Heidebrick, Germany. Well, I looked into it, all the records of Heidebrick, Germany uh, were destroyed in the war. And so I couldn't get any more. And just to show you that once you start the, this kind of research, it just doesn't stop when you finish your book. A few months ago, a fellow, a fellow researcher from Poland, a guy who I've been exchanging tips and, and leads with for, uh, oh, for almost 15 years, uh, who was really interested and did a lot of work on, because he, he lives in the area of the Blechhammer camp, and he did a lot of work with, on that. He uh, emails me and he says he just came across evidence about the Gestapo headquarters in Heidebrick, Germany. Now, Aaron, I've got to ask you to flip down to the last slide. And he sends me this ID card. This is an ID card of the head of the Gestapo office of Heidebrick, Germany, George Nowak. And George Nowak, uh, the reason this is important is because as I discovered, there's a whole subculture out there of people who, who collect war memorabilia, which is, you know, there are Americans who do that. And there are Americans who collect German war memorabilia. They're not Nazis. They're just, you know, what can I say? It's their thing. And within this subculture, there's another subculture, a specialist group that collects Gestapo uh, badges, which are called discs. They're literally round metal discs with the number stamped in and ID cards. And George Nowak's son, Uli Nowak, posted something on a German website called Forum der Wehrmacht. And that would be as much a legitimate website as Veterans of Foreign Wars or any American website of, of, of veterans. It is not a pro-Nazi website. And they have a big disclaimer there saying anything that tries to glorify or, or give credit to the National Socialist regime is stricken. Okay, let's put that on the table there. Uli Wehrmacht actually in his post is looking for the owner of this ID card because there's collectors out there that collect it. And in his post, he says, as you might imagine, I've had a very difficult time reconciling myself to my father's history, which he didn't know while his father was alive. Anyway, through internet searches, just to give you an idea, I come across the expert in the world when it comes to, of all things, Gestapo ID cards. And his name is Don Bible. I'm not making this up. His name is Don Bible, and he lives in Tennessee. 
And I got in touch with Don Bible, and he couldn't be more forthcoming. He's a man probably pushing 90 now. He is the world leading expert on Gestapo ID cards and Gestapo discs. And as he wrote to me, finding, oh, and after the war, the collectors, you know, this started being a thing. Hungarian or Romanian forgers started making forged phony Gestapo ID cards and flooding the market with them. So getting a legitimate one is a big deal. And they go for a lot of money. And he said to get an ID, a legitimate ID card is a big deal. To get a legitimate disc is a bigger deal. To get both the ID card and the disc from the same person is like a trifecta. Very, very rare, highly prized by collectors. He mentioned a figure of $50,000. I mean, this is insanity. Anyway, I just wanted to bring that up. Oh, and, and Don Bible uh, sent me through email uh, a stack of documents, maybe two inches thick, because he tracked down this guy. And this guy hid for the first three years after the war. He avoided prosecution. He changed his name. He started working with the British, helping hunt down, believe it or not, war criminals. He later slowly got rehabilitated. He was about to become rehabilitated to become a policeman again when he died of a stroke in 1961, I believe. So there you have it. And as we know, maybe 15% of the guards at Auschwitz were ever prosecuted. And very few of the concentration camp guards were ever prosecuted. And this is just another example of which. Anyway, I've, I've talked for too long. Uh, Rachel, I'm back to you. You've got your daughter, I, I see. <laughs> <laughs> She's demanding milk and water. Um, so yeah, this is really interesting. And if you guys want to see the documents, they are um, printed in the book, um, except for that very last one. Um, that was sort of the bonus that you guys are the first, we all are the first ones to see. So thank you for sharing that. Um, we don't have tons of time left, so I just want to ask you one question on a slightly different topic, and then we'll go to the audience questions. Um, one thing that we've discussed a lot at Rob Goodwin is this theory of epigenetics and intergener intergenerational trauma. Um, you take some issue with that um, idea, that concept that trauma can be passed down through the generations, even in the cells of your body, um, at least how Helen Epstein laid it out. I'm wondering um, what you found so uh, bothersome about the idea. It, do you think it's harmful to our understanding of the Holocaust or of the survivors and their families? Um, and I'm also wondering if writing the book changed your perspective on the issue. Um, you seemed maybe a little unwilling to become part of the story in the beginning, but at some point in writing it, you felt you realized that you had to, um, and that the documents were alone weren't enough without centering the people, including your own memories. So I'm wondering if your thoughts on that uh, idea um, about passed down trauma changed in any way through writing the book. No, um, I, I, um, I read the studies. Uh, there was a, a woman who, who wrote a study which uh, uh, she claimed or she, she her her research showed that uh, the, uh, the trauma affected the uh, the genetic the genes of our parents who, who were survivors, our grandparents who were survivors. And she wrote that her evidence showed that that uh, mutation or that change of the genes have been passed down to us. Well, a year or two later, other researchers, which I footnote in my book, showed just the opposite or showed that that's not true, that it is not true. Um, the problem I had with Helen Epstein, who was my classmate at Columbia Journalism and whose work I respect enormously, what I write in the book was my reaction at the time. She approached me while we were students with this idea that she had of writing about the, um, the damage, as she put it, um, inflicted on children of survivors by the Holocaust. And I bristled at that. I go, what damage? I didn't believe that there was damage. I certainly didn't feel I was damaged. I was affected by it, but damaged, that's a pretty strong word. When I started writing this book, I was asked, I asked friends of mine, a lot of friends, and uh, they all first said, yeah, of course we were damaged. But then I said, well, were you damaged or were you affected? And I said, well, really we were affected. 
And uh, that's how, that's where I, I feel. And, and the problem is this, our parents or our grandparents, they survived. They immigrated to the United States or to Israel or to Britain or to wherever. And they rebuilt their lives. They started families again, otherwise we wouldn't be here. They went into business to a lesser or greater extent. They were successful. Um, they didn't, uh, the Holocaust was there as a backdrop, but uh, in my family, it wasn't front and center. Um, maybe that's why, maybe other families it were. Um, and some, some friends of mine said, yeah, their parents, you know, talk them about it. Oh, you, you know, you have to be careful. Don't take things for granted. Okay. I think uh, a lot of parents in a lot of situations do that for their kids anyway, some lesser, some more. So uh, the idea of us um, wearing the suffering of our parents or grandparents as a, uh, as a crown of thorns uh, I, I, I don't, I don't buy that. I went on to build my own life. My brother went on to build his own life and friends of mine are successful lawyers, publicists, uh, publishers, writers, doctors, you know, uh, we've done a lot. And if we were so damaged, I don't know if that would have been possible. Now it may not be popular, but that's how I feel about it. And, uh, I, I hope I don't sound too defensive, but there, I, there you go. No, not at all. I, I really appreciate the, um, the, 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 the casting off of the mantle of victimhood. So I, I enjoyed your answer. Uh, Mike Bass has a question that connects to some of what you were just saying about how your family didn't center it. When, your father, when did your father pass away? And why do you think he never revealed his full story to you prior to his death? Oh, well, I think life goes on. Uh, um, uh, he passed away in 1985. I didn't even begin to look into this in, uh, well, in 1985, I got, I, I, when I was, I was an NBC reporter in Jerusalem. Um, I met his old buddy who knew him from before, who knew him from the ghettos, from the camps, and for 40 years afterwards, uh, Walter Spitzer, who was an artist, um, and you can Google him, he's quite a successful artist. Uh, he told me something, I taped it because I was a reporter and I taped it and I put the tape away and it stayed in a box with memorabilia for 20 years until I started this project. Um, I, I, what happens is when I was a kid, my father told me stories. As I got older, I started having my own life. I went to high school, I got into college, and, and life changed. You know, I had my own life. It wasn't anymore sitting on daddy's lap, hearing stories. Um, and his life had changed. He had become a successful small businessman with a, you know, a family business, a store. And, and I think in many ways, just like a lot of other survivors, he was moving on with his life. Uh, you know, Elie Wiesel said it took him 10 years till he could even write about his trauma. And other survivors who I spoke to said it took them decades before they could write about it. Others, you know, said, okay, I have a family now. What am I going to, you know, I didn't ask him any more questions. My brother didn't. We were, you know, I had girlfriends. I had jobs. I was, you know, doing life. Things had just evolved. Um, so we have a couple questions about the documents. I'm going to combine them for time's sake. Um, Esther Dukes wants to know, how did you deal with the foreign languages in the documents? And um, somebody with the last name Everstein wants to know, do you need to go to Poland to get, to get these kinds of documents or can one inquire without visiting Poland? Excellent questions, both of them. Uh, I hired on my own dime, uh, translators and I live in New York City and we have this great thing called Columbia University and you could put out a, uh, a request on the foreign the classical language website and uh, I got early on I got uh, somebody uh, 
to translate German documents who brought it home to her mother and they translated uh, very, very line for line and they duplicated the document in a Word document so that, you know, it actually looked like a document, but in English um, with tabs and everything. So um, they, were, they were wonderful, except they mistranslated a very key point, which is in the book, no time to get into it, um, that I discovered a decade later. Okay, so um, I hired translators for French, for Dutch, for German, uh, what else? Uh, those I think are the three languages that I, I hired people to do. Some were better than others, but they were all uh, pretty solid. Now, um, when I started, you had to do shoe leather reporting. Uh, you might be able to get a what they call a finding uh, aid online to tell you what's in a file someplace on a shelf in, a, in an archive. Since then, a lot has been digitized. And it's much easier now to, and on my website, uh, I have a tab that I just updated yesterday um, in anticipation of this talk. I have a tab called Holocaust Research, and it gives you a full, about a half a dozen sources of where to look for documents, where to look for information about your loved ones, and, and maybe some tips on how to go about it. Because even though you have a website, it's like being dropped in, in on a beach and looking for a grain of sand. So it's not always that easy uh, to do. Uh, yet, uh, the most rewarding, important documents or some of the most rewarding, important documents I found were still going through papers one at a time, looking for names, hundreds of pages, hours of work, and then you find that little piece of paper that makes it all worthwhile. And you say your three days or your week in Poland has been worth it because I found this little piece of paper. And, uh, you know, but I get turned on by things like that. Well, Mel Leitner, it has been such a pleasure to talk to you. I see that we keep getting more questions, but we are at 11 o'clock, or sorry, noon. And I believe we do have to end. Helen, give me a, a shake of the head. Yeah, I okay. think you're right. Okay, so I'm just going to let you know again how much I really enjoyed the book. Um, it's been a personal pleasure to get to talk with somebody who my parents have known for so long. Um, and it was a pleasure to get to chat with you before we did this. Uh, mostly what I wanna say in ending is just how much I appreciate the fact that you had the grit to get this done, that you, know, that you are speaking truth to power. The pen really is mightier than the sword. And, you know, in a time when there are so much in the way of Holocaust denial, so much in the way of conspiracy theories, so much in the way of anti-Semitism, which often goes um, unchecked, um, I just want to tell you, I appreciate your effort and your work you. and getting this out into the world. So thank you. I would you. just like to say, I, I see there are a number of questions on, on the chat box. I'm, I'm certainly available to answer anybody's questions and help anybody who's, uh, I'll do what I can. I mean, I'm, I'm got a little bit of expertise, but not a lot. Uh, it, you know, just, just reach out to me. Uh, I know Aaron's gonna pass around my website. You can Google me, it's pretty clear. Mel Leitner and you'll, it'll come up. Um, and I hope you buy the book and I hope you read the book. And uh, I have an offer out there that Aaron's gonna pass around too. But uh, just if you have any questions, that haven't been answered, I'm here for you. Yeah, so Aaron's gonna follow up with an email um, and it'll include a, a, a direct link. If you are interested in buying the book, um, you'll get a discount for having participated in this event. And I really found it to be a very worthwhile book. I really enjoyed it. I hope that some of you get a chance to read it as well. Um, thank you so much, Mel. And thanks to um, the Rob Goodwin Center for putting this on. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. Thank everyone. you both. This was a fascinating oh, conversation. I'm sure everyone who joined us this morning enjoyed it. And thanks to all of you for joining us this morning. Look forward to being together in person next year.